Mr. Silly McCullough, welcome to your first one with Comedy Hype, aka Hype Plus. How are you? How are you? And where have you been? You know, I'm going to just come out of the gate. Where you're you just been? asking the the real question to start it all off, huh? Uh, I'm great, dude. I'm I'm great, uh, and I've been good. You know, no complaints. Life is good. Uh, you know, uh, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. At Comedy hype. Well, I'm definitely excited to talk to you because, um, as I mentioned off camera, like you were someone that I've always seen in different parts of my life. I specifically remember you on the Jamie Foxx show, um, as of course, um, working with the Wayans family. Yeah. So I want to, one, get to those moments, but I really want to get a chance to get to know who Sully McCullough is. Okay. I think that's, okay. that's the journey here. And then not only that, how you continue to navigate in Hollywood, um, but let's take it back. So were we born and raised in California? Uh, yeah, I was born and raised in California. Uh, I was born in LA, but I grew up in Northern California. Uh, you know, went to Cupertino High School, uh, which is across the street from Apple Computer. I remember we used to take field trips to Apple Computer, which was cool. Um, and it was crazy to see like, how that company blew up and it was so in our backyard. I think um, early on that kind of taught me, you know, I was in this moment in time next to this super company that changed the world. So that was kind of cool to grow up with that in your backyard because I think it, it, it taught me to um, always think globally and think bigger than your environment. So that was, that was really cool. Yeah, how did, um, and, and that's fascinating to hear, like were there any direct stories with you and Apple? Did you see Steve Jobs out one day? Like how close did you this know, story it, get to you? You know, it's funny, like uh, back in the day, you know, Apple was just starting to blow up and I would always drive past his parking lot, see, like his parking space. So you knew where Steve Jobs parking space was. And, you know, like I worked in the mall and, you know, the, the people that worked with Apple had money, you know, <laughs> so it was like that. That was just really cool. It was just cool to see. Like I said, like Apple is a game changer. You know what I mean? It's the, the, the biggest company in the world. It has changed the way we think, the way we communicate. Um, just being around that, it was like, you know, that was like a, a, a good little blueprint of having an idea and being able to see how far you could take it, which I definitely used to, you know, navigate my career for sure. How would you describe the town that you grew up in, in terms of, um, race in terms of, uh, financial status? Like wh where was that? Well, you know, I mean... Silicon Valley, you know, had money. Uh, we didn't have money. Uh, we were like, I felt like we were like the black family that lived in this mostly white neighborhood where all my neighbors owned their houses and we rented. You know what I mean? Like, which is different than if you grow up in the hood and everybody's on the same level. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I felt like we were like the black monsters. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know, it was definitely it was so it was a conversation around like when you came up that you were black. Was that kind of like something? Yeah, that was I mean, you know, day? like y y when you're when you're, you know, one of two black families and, you know, it comes up, you know, you're aware of it. But I also was like, I knew the power of comedy even back then. You know what I mean? Like I was a funny kid. Uh, I knew how to hold attention and make people laugh. Like, you know, back in the day, I was like the smart class clown. You know what I mean? Like I would make my friends laugh, but then I would also answer the teacher's question, if that made sense. You know what I mean? So I learned like how to work both sides of it. Got you. So I, I asked that because what did your parents do and what was their story that they did they come up in Silicon Valley or did they? Well, yeah, my mom, my mom worked uh, by, you know, Silicon Valley. Like, it's funny, like Silicon Valley is like very similar to Hollywood in the way that the computer industry is the thing that drives everything up there. And here in in Hollywood, it's show business. So it was like I traded 
one thing for another. Like both my parents worked uh, for computer places. You know, my mom had a job at Lockheed. My stepfather had a job at Lockheed. So I think I was familiar with, you know, the, the, the one big thing driving the town. Yeah. Yeah. Now, as far as um, being in an environment where I'm assuming that you were primarily like the only black person at times? Well, there were there were two. There were two of us. There were two. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> you got to give Mike Barnes his props, you know? <laughs> so like, you know, I think that's something that um, we all have a conversation with ourselves of how do we want to stay true to ourselves, but also like kind of play the game at, at times sure. to where we're not, you know, um, especially as a black person, you can become intimidating and, and some people may feel, oh, okay, we, like, how did you start having those conversations with yourself to position yourself to where you can still be seen as a black man, but one that was still true to his roots? Like, how did, how well, did you I, I'll tell you, i tell you this. Um, I was, I was raised by educators, right? And that was really helpful. And that was actually one of the reasons why we settled in Cupertino, right? The school systems were good. We knew coming up that education was our way out. You know what I mean? Like, you know, some people that taught sports is your way out. Like we knew education was the way out. And then, you know, I was also smart enough to know that area that I grew up in, we had better resources, you know what I mean? So. I took the education part of it really seriously. I was also, um, you know, I, I grew up having a real understanding of my blackness, which was great too. You know, my, uh, my mom went to San Jose State. My father ran track at San Jose State. So the black, uh, black power athletes from the 68 Olympics were family friends. So. I was really lucky that I had this real intense pro-black experience mixed in with this very white seeming upbringing. You know what I mean? So it was like, okay, we're here for the education and the access and all that, but we're also super black. You know what I mean? So that was that was great. And I had cousins in East Palo Alto and Richmond. So when I really needed to get into it, I could get into it and they would make fun that I spoke white and all that. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever? Uh, yeah, I was going to kind of ask, like, did you ever get kind of criticism because of someone being educated and how you spoke? Of did course, of course. And that's, you know, I think that's just part of the journey. That's part of the journey of learning who you are and the totality of who you are. And when you're growing up and you're younger, you know, you're, you're going to be challenged in that way. Like I remember when I would first, you know, spend time with my cousins in Richmond, they would be like, dude, you sound white, you talk white. And I didn't know quite how to receive that or how to like respond to it. Like, do you, you know, you, like I knew not to reject who I was, but you also take that, w what that is that you're getting, you know what I mean? So I, I think I was, the, the, the thing that I'm most lucky about is I had a tremendous sense of self. And I think that came from my mom. I think it came from the educators that were around me. Like I was raised around very strong women that imparted in me that, you know, who you are is special, you know, the route that you're taking in life has value and trust. You may be a little different, but that difference is going to yield results down the road, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, that's super impactful in terms of having the right foundation um, in our household. I think that a lot of people can agree with that. Yes. Now, yeah. In school, did you play sports at all? You mentioned that you're- I, I ran track, um, you know, cause my father ran track and I was fast, but I was little dude, I was little, you know, like, so I didn't, um, I didn't start playing ball till college. And it was, and, and it's, and it's such a, it's, it's one thing that I totally regret because I went to UCLA, right? And you know, that is a basketball school 
you know, I wasn't good enough to make the team or anything, but I got good fast. And, you know, when I started playing ball, I loved it, dude. And, you know, uh, I just, it just made me regret that I didn't even go that route. And I think I probably, you know, if I'm being dead up, I think I probably didn't go that route because I was at a primarily white school. You yeah, know what I mean? Let's like, dissect that. What do you mean by like, how did like, that like, you? like there was this, you know, there was this, this stereotype of what a black dude is supposed to do and how you're supposed to move. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, yeah, I, I ain't doing that. I'm doing this. You know what I mean? But when I started doing that in college, I was like, damn, why didn't I do that back then? You know, I'm, I'm one of two black dudes in, in, in the school. The other black dude played ball. We would have had two brothers on the team. We would have been infinitely better. Right. Interesting. And I am, I can, in transparency, I can relate to that. Um, sometimes you not, don't want to walk the stereotypical path. Right. And so you right. decide to go other. But ironically, if you would have trusted your own um, instinct, then you would have maybe succeeded in something else. Like... Um, just for the listeners and yourself. Yes. I grew yes. up in Ho I grew up in Hawaii, right? So uh -huh. being in Hawaii, surfing was like the thing to do. But you know what I did? I told myself black people don't surf, so I never gave it an opportunity or consideration until later on when I was just about to leave the island. I really got into it and I loved it. Right. And so who knows? I could have right. been like right. the Tiger right. Woods of surfing. But you know what's, what's I, interesting about that too is like, I think in life you find it when you find it. And maybe if I played ball in high school, I would have pursued that and that would have been my thing. Like I did, I did do speech and debate in high school and I was really good at it. I was state champion in high school. I went to the nationals. Like that's where I first started getting noticed for my sense of humor, you know, my ability to give speeches, the fact that I was charismatic, like, you know what I mean? So that's what I was into. I was into, you know, it, w speech and debate is more nerdy, it, you know what I mean? But I was yielding results from it and I was, you know, I was, I was good at it. So that's where my interest was. You know, it wasn't until college when, you know, uh, um, Chris Spencer and I went to college together. We met at UCLA and that was one of those friendships that took me in a different direction. And, you know, he played ball in high school. And so, you know, you do what your friends do. So I went from going to the library to going to the basketball court. Like I now used to, I'm going to tell you this, this is hilarious. I used to, this is how far removed I was from the game. When I first started playing basketball, I didn't have basketball shoes, right? I used to play in Vans, okay? Which is a super white boy shoe. So the fact that I became a sneakerhead and a hoop head after that, like shows you just where I came from. Like I was on that way over here. Now, one thing you mentioned, right? Um, I was gonna ask you, how did it feel when you were able to get around your own people? Did you, was there appreciation when you start falling in love with basketball? And Absolutely, and absolutely. Like I felt like, you know, when you're the only one or you're one of two, you're navigating on your own. And I felt like, you know, like I said, when Chris and I became friends, we became friends because, you know, uh, he heard I was funny, right? Like we both transferred into UCLA and lived in the dorms in the summer program. And this dude literally heard I was funny through the mix and came knocking on my door like, I hear you're funny, prove it. You know what I mean? So we instantly became friends and like fast friends, like brothers. And it just took me down another road. You know what I mean? It was like, oh, I never had a friend like this that, you know, it, it, like, you know, all of a sudden you're, you're at a whole, all the different parties, you know, like just my whole, my college experience was like my life awakening, if that makes sense. You know, that's when I started doing stand up. you know, I was doing it, you know, at UCLA, we had a comedy club and, 
you know, but I w- w- we were fully focused. We were like, look, this is what we want to do. We're here for college, but not really. Like we're really here to pivot this thing to have a career in comedy. Super dope. Now, as far as um, something you mentioned about sports, um, you said that uh, something about being small in stature. Yeah. So therefore, yeah. maybe you, it may be limited of what sports or how involved you got with it. Let's talk about that only from a reason of seeing you on camera. It's been used as like some of your punchlines. How has and if you want to be specific, like how tall, what, what like have you always been kind of like a, the smaller I've guy? always been I've always been this size, maybe maybe smaller. Like, you know what I mean? like, I've always been little. And so the funny thing is, is like. I don't think of myself as small until I look around and see, oh, there's people way bigger than you. You know what I mean? So I think I have like, I have a big heart and I move like a dude that's that's bigger than he is just in relation to the rest of the world. I'm a little dude. And so I think that one of the first rules of comedy is you have to talk about the real. You know what I mean? Like you have to approach it from a very real place. And if you don't do that, then you're you're not you're not doing the thing. You know what I mean? So it would be weird for me to not acknowledge my size at all. You know what I mean? Like it just wouldn't make it'll sense. Be on the it's like people psyche a little bit. It'd be yes. Like- yes. Like and, you know, all my life experiences are based on how people perceive me based on my size. You know, when we were going to clubs back in the day, the bouncer would, you know, stop me first. It was like, hey, dude, how come you got your hand in my chest and not the dude your size? Like, he don't want to fight with the dude his size. He knows he can get away with doing that to me. So, so yeah, that's kind of where I, I, I wanted to kind of walk through, like, the misconceptions, because one is a level of, you know, people think that, OK, I can kind of punk this guy around. Right. Then there's a reality of this is a black man who, um, as we'll find out, has a family and children that is a protector, a provider. So. But not only you- not only that, dude, I'm the oldest of seven. You know what I mean? Like I'm the oldest. And when you're the oldest, you got to look out for everybody under you. You know what I mean? Like I was I was the cheap babysitter. You know what I mean? And the caretaker and, the you know, Like in in some cases, I was the leader, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's really funny. Like on Jamie Foxx, like I played a dude named Mouse, you know what I mean? And, you know, when I see people and people see me, they go, uh, Mouse, like, is it okay if I call you that? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? Like, that's how you know me. And I think that with that character specifically, I think that character resonates with people people actually feel a connection to that dude because they understand what that is. You know what his obstacles are. You know what I mean? Like he's a little dude trying to make people realize he's bigger than he is. Like that's a natural conflict that we all get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love to um, be able to dissect the character more because it is one of those classic characters. Um, You were in 25 episodes as a character of the Jamie Foxx show. However, in my mind, it made me feel like he was like right there, part of the cast, like anyone else. That's the, yeah, that, that, I mean, that's the beautiful thing about that show and that experience. Like I actually, I did one episode season three where I played a different character, right? And so I did that and I thought, okay, cool. I guest starred on the Jamie Foxx show. You know, Jamie and I were friends. We met in the comedy clubs back when we, we're both first starting. Um, I think he saw Don't Be a Menace and, you know, liked what I did with Crazy Legs. And so, you know, I don't even think I, I don't even think I auditioned for that guest star part. I think it was just offered to me, right? So I came in, I knocked it out and I was like, okay, cool. I I did an episode of the Jamie Foxx show. Season four, they brought myself, Chris Spencer, Alex Thomas on because they wanted to give Jamie friends and we all worked at Jingles 2000. And, you know, Chris and I went to college together. Alex and I knew each other from the clubs. Uh, My ex managed Alex. 
So we were family, you know what I mean? So I think that when the three of us, you know, first appeared on that show, we got 20 years of history, you know what I mean? From being in the clubs, making each other laugh after shows, like, so we had this, we, we were already up and running. So everything felt very familiar and we were still hungry. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so since we're here, who came up with mouse? Like, did you decide to just lean into it when we talk about stature and size and said, well, you know, you know, like they, you know, that part was, was offered to me and you know, like I'm, I'm an actor. I'm gonna, you know, I go, okay, this is what you're playing find a way to really play it, you know, I'm gonna use real parts of myself, but I love that character because that character is more naive than I am in real life, so I can play that naiveness, you know what I mean? Like, I felt like that character worked on that show because Jamie's super cool, you know what I mean? Like, Jamie's this fully formed dude that it's the Jamie Foxx show, and he's Jamie, Jamie Foxx, you know what I mean? Mouse is a dude that wants to be like Jamie Foxx on his best day, but that's never going to happen. You know what I mean? So it was like, it was fun to play that. Like I was playing a dude that so looked up to Jamie that he's trying to, you know, I didn't even know how to date on that show. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, so there, there was so much fun like I really drew on my college experience for Mouse. Like I like the dude I was in college was very similar to who Mouse is, except I maybe had a little more drive. You know what I mean? Yep. Now that particular role, which was Mouse, it does kind of um I think like any actor you have to be mindful. Was this one of your first role early roles, by the way? No, not it wasn't it wasn't one of my first roles like I I guest starred on, you know, a bunch of other shows prior to that. I guest starred on Married with Children. That was one of my first like guest starring roles. I played this dude on Married with Children who worked at this record store called Final Vinyl. And he all you had to do was walk into the store and hum a song and my character knew exactly what it was. So Al Bundy came into the store because he couldn't get this song out of his head and hummed it and I knew exactly what it was. So that was like one of my first roles. Um, prior to the Jamie Foxx show, I was in What's Love Got To Do With It. I played one of the kids, I played Craig Turner in that. But that wasn't a comedy, that was a drama. And I think I only had like a couple lines in the movie. The reason why, um, go ahead, I'm sorry. But yeah, but so I think Mouse was like one of the first things after Don't Be a Menace where I got to be a, a, a fully formed character. You know what I mean? Yeah. The reason why I mentioned that is because I think like any actor, you have to think about typecasting. Oh, absolutely. And I um, did an interview with your um, Jamie Foxx co-star, Christopher B. Duncan. Yes. Who in a yes. previous clip, um, or part of our conversation, mentioned the hurt he felt when it came to the industry and how they saw him. Meaning they only saw him as Braxton um, when he goes to auditions. Yes. Do yeah. you have any similar trajectory? Or well, he's like, like I, I think Christopher B. Duncan is a great example of a trained actor that was so good at that role, that's all you saw him as. You know what I mean? I think my character in relation to the Jamie Foxx show, like I came on board later and I think I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to be so much of a character that that happened to me. And I really tried to play the nuances of that character so he felt more real, you know what I mean? Like, and, and don't and, and don't get me wrong. Like, I think Christopher B. Christopher B. Duncan is an amazing actor. You know what I mean? And it was so cool to be able to hop on a show that already had its legs and then just add to it. But I was I was mindful of that. Like, I think every job you get in Hollywood, you want it to lead to other opportunities. Like, that's 
a lot of what the business is about that a lot of people won't tell you. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're getting a chance to step up to the plate and you want to hit a grand slam. So it leads to other times that you can step up to the plate. Got you. So in, in, in conclusion with that particular role, are there any regrets or do you think um, if people calling you mouse in person to this day, it's not an issue? No, that doesn't. No, I don't feel bad about that at all. Like, I don't feel bad about that at all. Uh, my only regret is that I started playing that character in the fourth season. So we went, you know, I did half the episodes of the fourth season and then all the episodes of the fifth season. And after we got our hundredth episode, the show was done. So I felt like when it was ending, I was just starting to get rolling. You know what I mean? So that was my only regret was that, oh, it's over. You know? Yeah. You know? When um when the show did end, was it abrupt for you? Did you know the backstory and why they weren't gonna continue with the show? Well, you know, if you work in this business, you understand the business part of it. And unfortunately, with black shows, once they get those hundred episodes, they're like, cool, we can sell it into syndication and we're done. Like, it's not a situation like Friends or something where they've got this train that they want to continue to keep investing in. So that was that was unfortunate. You know what I mean? Like we had we we had a great rhythm like we were we were we were really like cooking. You know what I mean? Like and there was so much good that came from that show like. You know, I mean, Sherry Shepard played my girlfriend, you know what I mean? Like, look at where she is now, you know, Garcelle is fancy. Look at where she is now, you know, uh, Christopher B. Duncan, you know, Chris Spencer, Alex Thomas, uh, you know, everybody on that show, Garrett Morris, you know, Garrett Khalida Morris Smith was on there, too. Yes, exactly. You know, uh, like there, there's, there was so much good and we had, you know, we were like, I, I'll tell you this about the show. Um, when I when I first got hired, I knew that show was going to be around forever because I knew what Jamie's talent level was. I knew where he was going in the business. So every time, every episode, I was like, we're making legendary TV and you better be as funny as possible because this is going to be around for a while. So that was that was a cool realization to have on my part that informed how we approached it. Because in my, in, in, in my opinion, you know, you have Martin as, to me, the top dog when it comes to black sitcoms. Sure. I would say Jamie Foxx show is right there for me, like right under there. And people Jillian. like right now they're debating it. You know what I mean? Like I've seen on social media, like what's funnier, Martin or Jamie Foxx show and you know, I want to vote, but I don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you have any um, input in any of the writing of the Jamie Foxx show? Um, well, anything that you well, can kind of, yeah. That was, that, that was, uh, we, we had a really interesting way of working, which I think, you know, to this day was a great training ground for what came after that for me personally. What we would do on the Jamie Foxx show is we would do um, a scripted pass, which was, we would play the scene out when we were shooting it as scripted, right? And then once we got that, we would do a wild pass, right? And the wild pass could be anything. Like we could take that scene way over here if we wanted to, right? And that's how we shot that show. And usually what happened was you would take the scripted pass, you would take the wild pass and the episodes would be a blend of both of those. And we all knew each other so well and could improv and flow, you know, from our stand up background. And, you know, I had an improv comedy background that the way we worked on that show was was like it was it was magical. You know what I mean? Like we would just sometimes we would improv these scenes and we didn't know where they were going, but we trusted each other enough and knew our characters enough that we, we would come up with gold sometimes. Dope. Now, kind of moving um, back in time, before okay. the Jamie Foxx show, 
you would end up. This is like last it. dance. It's like you show a piece of Michael Jordan winning a championship and then you go back to when he broke his leg. <laughs> speaking of speaking of legs, crazy legs. Wow. <laughs> wow. You see what you did there? <laughs> I, I do want to talk about your role and don't be a menace to South Central while drinking your juice in the hood. And thank now, you for saying the whole title. Yes. You have to. One, I was going to ask you, who came up with that name? Do you know that whole title? The title, I do know the story behind it. The whole title is a mix of all the movies that Don't Be a Menace is based on, right? So all those titles are the direct original movies. And the reason that Sean and Marlon made that long title was, you know how when you go to the movie theater and you see the choices on the marquee? They wanted to use all the letters for Don't Be a Menace. So if you went to the movies, your only choice was to see Don't Be a Menace to South Central while drinking your juice in the hood. Eesh. Yeah. Yeah. Because some people call it, some people call it Don't Be a, I think it's like Don't Be a Menace to South Central while drinking your juice or like some people don't always say it. They kind of the stop. Yes. They, they stop at some point. Yeah. yeah. But that was the, that was the reason behind it. That's why it was a really long title. Got you. Yeah. Got you. So a lot of people don't solid. know that. That's a little, a little comedy hype gym. <laughs> yeah, strategy. And their whole notion was to catch people's attention while they were in the movie theaters. Yes, yes. And you know, like back in the day, that's how you went to the movie theater. You know, like, am I gonna see Jaws? Am I gonna see Don't Be a Menace to South Central while drinking your juice in the hood? And if we had all the letters, sorry, Jaws. <laughs> Got you. No, so help me, help me. I'm trying to make sure I understand this, and particularly I. I feel like I messed your head up with that one right now. Viewers, okay, are you saying that all the letters being their meaning, they might just see like juice in the like juice in the hood and be like, oh, that's interesting, or what do you mean by all the letters? Well, you know how like the marquee has the the letters that make up the titles. Yep. If you use a long title, you got to use almost all your letters. Understood. So you don't have like, say you're say it's like a, a the movie theater has like six or seven movies. If you used all the letters for don't be a menace to South Central while drinking your juice in the hood. You can't promote the other you ones. can't promote the other movies. Makes so, sense. Wow. wow. Yeah. And did it work out? Did it work out? That Message. Way? <laughs> <laughs> now, let's talk about your 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 character. Crazy legs. Well, let me, let me, before I go to Crazy Lex, how did you even um, team up with the Wayans family and link up with that camp? Um, that came from being in the comedy clubs. Like it all, it all started in comedy. You know what I mean? Like back in those days, post-college, like when I, when I graduated UCLA, I started emceeing at the Laugh Factory and the Improv in Hollywood, right? Like I started bringing up all the acts and all the A-list acts at the time, it was John Witherspoon, it was Damon Wayans, it was Keenan Wayans, it was, you know, Jerry Seinfeld. It was like the dudes that were the big dogs in the club. And, you know, I was a newer standup, but I was emceeing these incredible shows, you know what I mean? And, and learning the ropes with the best of the best. So, you know, Sean and I were about the same age and we had both started around the same time. Um, so we instantly became friends, like just because, you know, we were both young and, you know, we're in the trenches, you know, trying to get our funny off. And that's how we became friends. So, you know, it was it was really just luck of being at the right place at the right time with the right focus. You know what I mean? And I, I luckily fell into a camp of the best of the best. Yeah. In that you would land this role of crazy legs. Yes, um, did I did have to. I'm going to tell you this, dude. I did have to audition like just because I was friends with the weigh-ins. The weigh-ins don't give you anything. You better earn it. Right. I had to audition for crazy legs five times. Five times. Like I also read for other things in the movie, but they weren't just, oh, you're playing crazy legs. No, I had to, I had to earn that. 
So I, I, I love that about them, them though. You know what I mean? Because, you know, just cause you're friends, that ain't, that ain't enough. You know what I mean? The product is on point. Yes. You gotta, you gotta bring it. And luckily, you know, I tapped into what made that character interesting and unlocked it. And it ended up being, you know, the springboard that pushed me out there in a major way. Yeah. How crazy, well, how crazy did it get for you when the film did come out? Um, did people know right away who you were or did it take some time for people to identify? It, it did take a little movie? time. Like that movie was interesting because um, when it first came out, it made a little bit of splash. Like I'll, I'll give you the, I'll give you the history of that movie. Like Fridays had come out six months before that. And Fridays was a runaway, breakout, game-changing, super hit. You know what I mean? Like, it changed the culture. It made Chris Tucker a superstar. Like, that movie was out of here, right? Don't Be a Menace, when it came out, it did good, but it didn't really find its audience until it went to cable, which was about six months after it came out. So... You know, like I was saying earlier, you know, as a, as an actor, as a as a talent, you want to step to the plate and hit a grand slam. And if you don't hit a grand slam, you feel like, OK, back to the drawing board. Right. So when Dopey Menace came out, it was cool. It made an impact. You know, people liked it, but it didn't. It wasn't Fridays. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, all right, well, you know, I tried. Right. <laughs> But when it went to cable and people started watching it over and over again, and then they could reference the movies that we were parodying, that's when it blew up. So it blew up late. You know what I mean? Like you know, it had it like a, a first. Was it a first of its kind in terms of like black cinema to see someone making these parodies? Yes. Yeah. And I remember like I remember we went to screen it at the Magic Johnson Theater and I remember sitting in the back and watching people watch it. And some people in the theater didn't realize we were paired in these other movies. So they were watching it like, oh, this is just another hood movie. You know what I mean? Which that's kind of interesting too, that they didn't even realize, oh no, this is a parody movie. But yeah, when it went to cable, that's when it took a life of its own. And I think the most interesting thing about that movie is that it stood the test of time. You know what I mean? Like my son just graduated high school, but when he was in high school, one day he came home and he goes, uh, he goes, dad, my friends think you're cool. <laughs> Cause his friends had discovered don't be a menace. And they were like, yo, that's your dad. You know what I mean? So that's the great thing about creating something that ends up having a life of its own, you don't know where it's going to go to. But it, it, it goes a lot of places. Correct. Now, in that you have a very, very popular scene, which is the dance performance scene. And ideally, I'm instantly reminded of MC Hammer. Sure. Sure. Um, yeah. Now, yeah. there's a kind of a, uh, I'll get to my question. One is the Wayans is known to spoof everyone and anybody, especially during in living color days. Sure. So this sure. was no different than that. Yes. Um, this yeah. was a spoof of sorts around MC Hammer. Now, did MC Hammer himself have any comment about this? Um, were there any apprehensions of doing a MC Hammer spoof for you as an actor? Um, if he did, I don't know about it. Um, my daughter actually did a commercial with MC Hammer long after Don't Be a Menace when she was a little girl and it was a Super Bowl commercial and, you know, like she was young enough at the time that I went on set. And so I talked to Hammer and was like, oh yeah, I did this movie with the Wayans, Don't Be a Menace, where, you know... Uh, my character has a dream and it's to be like MC Hammer and he got a kick out of it. You know what I mean? So that was really like cool to meet Hammer 
and have this, you know, exchange with him via him working with my daughter. You know what I mean? And I'll tell you this, like the Wayans will parody somebody, but I think Crazy Legs legit, that was his legit dream. You know what I mean? So I'm not making fun of Hammer. Like Hammer's way up here. You know what I mean? Like Crazy Legs wants to be like Hammer. Right. So when he says, <laughs> yeah, I have a dream, like he means it. You see like how I slipped the Crazy Legs in there? You see how I did that? <laughs> <laughs> now I was gonna so so that kind of opens another door um with you doing that um rendition of of, of crazy legs the character um one thing that I remember about mouse was his laugh yeah yeah how aligned is that actually being silly's laugh or the character's laugh is that is that part of you too well you know what it's like I think people take from it what they're gonna take I think crazy legs was such a blown out character. Like, you know, like the 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 dude in Boys in the Hood that he's based on, which, you know, is the dude in the wheelchair on the scoop on the stoop with the pacifier. Right. Like I watched those movies over and over again. And then when I went to, like, create Crazy Legs because it was a Wayans comedy, you've got to take it to the next level. Right. So I, you know, I, I did a lot of people watching. Uh, I remember I went to this little, you know, this little cookout and I saw a dude in a wheelchair that had mad energy. And I was like, yo, there's something there. Right. And I just pieced little different things to make crazy legs. And anybody that talks in a high pitched voice like, yeah, that's the way you start the day. You know what I mean? Like you can't be mad at that dude. You know what I mean? Like. And that guy, like, like my goal was to create, like when you think of somebody in a wheelchair, you think, oh, they're handicapped or they're, you know, somehow deficient. What if I go way over here and, and make him the, 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 the biggest energy dude in the room where he's so hyped, he gets you hyped where you don't even like you forget he's in a wheelchair. Like that was my. That was like the, the actor's work behind it. You know what I mean? Like, and I wanted to create, I wanted to take the basis of what the character was based on and create something totally new. So that was, that was, that was like the behind the scenes actor, what I wanted to accomplish in the actor with Crazy Legs. So when I laugh on stage and people go, oh, there's the laugh, you know what I mean? It's just me laughing. But if you think it sounds like crazy legs, cool. If you think, you know, my laugh as mouse sounds like, you know, a little bit of crazy legs and, you know, some of me, I'm, I'm cool with it. Maybe is there a way, have you, have you trademarked it? Because it is a rememberable laugh. I, I like, should, I, I should. We package that up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We do, we do need to do something with that. Yeah. That's, uh, I'm, I'm giving money away. Yeah. Now you being a comedic writer and, and we just talked about laughter. Is there a reason why um, do people people still use laugh tracks, right? On on sitcoms and on stuff. On sitcoms, stuff? they do. Ones? Yeah, they do. Yeah. Has yeah. it been kind of like taboo not to use it in terms of your work um, today? Like in stand up, you know, there's no laugh track, of course. Like you know, you're getting the laughs that you earn with your jokes. Um, you know, in TV, TV's gonna do what TV does. You know what I mean? Like, I think we had a laugh track on Jamie Foxx, I guess, I guess you know what I mean? I know I was laughing a lot on that show. You know what I mean? Did you guys, is, was that shot in front of a live studio audience? Yep, yep, we shot in front of a live audience. You know, like I said, that show was, that show was very, very, very special. Um, one of my best memories of shooting live on the Jamie Foxx show, was um, when Whitney Houston was still alive. Her and Bobby came down one taping just to hang out with us. You know what I mean? And I mean, that was that was extraordinary, dude. Like to have like Whitney Houston and Bobby Brown just hanging out backstage. You know what I mean? And and Whitney was so I remember her being like just so supportive. And like she's like, you guys are so funny. And you know what I mean? Like that was like that. You know, it, that was one of those things where I was like, wow, this is this is unbelievable. You know what I mean? Like she's at the top, 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 top 
and she's supporting us. And I remember afterwards, like after we finished taping, we ended up going to, to karaoke because Jamie used to like to karaoke back then. And Bobby and Whitney came to karaoke and they did their songs at a karaoke spot in Hollywood, which was like, yo, this is next level. Like to hear Whitney Houston do greatest love of all at a karaoke spot. And this was before they had cameras on the phones, right? And people were so blown away. They were calling their phones. That's when everybody had answering machines and holding it up just so they had records of that. Like it was, that was one of those, those memories where it was like, Yo, the Jamie Foxx show is legendary. Dope. Now, another legendary, um, let's say, project that you were part of is Scary Movie 2. Yes. Some people don't know that you were the voice of the clown. I was the clown under the bed in Scary Movie 2. Yeah. And uh, was, there other, was there other attachments to the movie that you were also part of or just that? Role? That, was, that, was the, that was the that was the main for as far as Scary Movie 2 goes, that was my contribution. So I remember, I definitely remember, I want to say Scary Movie 1. Yes. Um, yes. I definitely would say Scary Movie 2. But I think I remember Sean and his character, I can't tell if he was bi or just like closeted. Um, <laughs> but I remember as a young man being like, what the, like what? The yes, heck? there was, was something. Very, yeah. It was yeah. very sh like shocking. And, yes. Um, it, you know, it it probably was the, again the way it's pushing the envelope. Sure. Um, sure. Was there any apprehensions going into that role? Um, because I think the clown would end up seducing or getting him. And seducing him. Get that's a back. that's a good way to put it. Uh, he does a little more than seduce him. I I I'll, I'll tell you like this. Um, when they called me and and asked me to to voice that character, they had already shot the scene, right? So. I'm doing the voiceover to everything that happens in that scene. So I'm trying to take it to the next level. And it was, it, and, and, and that um, voiceover, you know, is different than Crazy Legs. You know what I mean? Like this is a demented clown that is like kind of an X-rated clown. You know what I mean? And so when I saw the scene, I was like, okay, cool. I know what to do with this. And I just voiced over all the pieces to, to, to that scene. And you know, like the comedian in you wants to make something as funny as possible. You know what I mean? And comedy requires you to push the envelope. So that character was already wild, right? And when I came in, I was like, I just want to make this super funny and super memorable. So that was my, I don't get, I don't get caught up in the, uh, the judginess of is this politically correct or not? I think that that's not good for comedy. You know what I mean? Like that's for other people to do. And we live in this PC culture now and cancel culture is so big. That's the death of comedy sometimes. You know what I mean? Like I have, certain lines that I'm not going to cross, but if it's in the name of funny and it's undeniably funny, I'm in there. Right. Now, a part of that, um, the franchise itself would start with the Wayans, but then it would shift over somewhere else. Right. You being right. someone close and kind of like, um, and, and this is for the listeners, because we've covered this on our platform, the Weinstein company would end up uh, overtaking it from them. Sure. It's been the conversation sure. that we followed. Um, how did you receive that? Did you have issues? Did you like, you know, without necessarily, you know, you know, telling too much or whatever you can share about that time they were going through when they lost their franchise? Well, once again, that's the business and we are in show business and the business part of it dictates the show. You know what I mean? Um, the Wayans are my friends, you know what I mean? Like, and I learned so much for them. They were like mentors to me that I'm always gonna ride with my people, you know what I mean? So when that happened and they took that franchise, you saw what the result was. 
like those later movies aren't nearly as funny. Like they lost their tone, they lost their direction, they lost their way, which also speaks to the power of what it is that gifted comedians do. You know what I mean? They do something that not everyone can do. And the business will try and make it seem like, oh, we can just get anybody to do this. No, you can't. So that was my takeaway from that. Like when that went on its way, it was like, okay, I'm still rocking with the Wayans because they're the people that put me on and those are the people I respect. So I, I kind of want to take our conversation to something that is more in recent times. Okay. As well as that I think aligns with um, something that you can relate to on in two fronts, I would say. One, you mentioned earlier about your stature and people testing you physically because they, they didn't feel you were intimidating. Then you have another part of it with you being a writer, and um, not just any writer, but a writer for award shows and, and whatnot. Where do you land and do you have any connection to what we um, saw when it came to Chris Rock being slapped by Will Smith? Um, is there any backstory that you can be able to share, like what went down um, from your perspective? Well, um, you know, just so so people are clear, when the Jamie Foxx show finished, um, Jamie started hosting award shows. And, um, you know, he hosted the ESPY Awards, uh, the MTV uh, Video Awards, the VMAs. Um, and, you know, myself, Chris Spencer, we started writing for him, you know. And uh, so we were behind the scenes, you know, in, in a writing capacity. And once I started writing and producing, that took a life of its own. So a lot of people feel like, well, what happened to you after the Jamie Foxx show? I started writing and producing and that didn't stop. You know what I mean? Like, you know, Jamie was was blowing up and he was getting these great opportunities to host these big award shows. You know, he brought along the dudes that he trusted. We had a rapport. We know how to create things that were funny, that, that made an impact. So my career went in a different direction. And that's another thing about Hollywood is like, if it starts happening, you just go with the flow. You know what I mean? It wasn't like I, I ever felt like, oh, okay, I'm done acting. It's just, I didn't stop working as a writer producer, right? And most recently, um, you know, prior to getting hired to write on that Oscars where, you know, that happened between Will and Chris, I was Cedric the Entertainer's head writer on the, um, the Emmys. I wrote on the American Music Awards and then I got hired to write on the Oscars. And okay. that's rarefied air, you know what I mean? Like back when I first started doing stand up, there's no way that you could have told me, oh, one day you're gonna write on the Oscars. You know, I, I guest starred on Fresh Prince. Uh, Will and Jada and I, we've been friends forever. You know what I mean? Like that's the thing that I think people forget about this business is you know, as you're coming up, you're coming up with everybody else that's coming up. You know what I mean? Like you all hang out together, you're friends. Like, so that moment specifically to answer your question was extremely personal for me. You know what I mean? Like here I am writing on my first Oscars. I'm friends with Will and Jada. I'm friends with Chris. Chris has been you know, a sounding board and somebody that I've looked up to for my entire career and will as well. And so the fact that there's this conflict that takes place on live TV and you're one of the writers and they're saying after it happened, well, who wrote the joke? You know what I mean? Like they're coming at the writing staff, like somehow we had something to do with this. So it was, it was like, it was such a, 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 
a personal and public moment. You know what I mean? Where everything sort of intersected in this way where it was like, wow, like this is not what I expected was going to happen Oscar night. You know what I mean? First time writing the Oscars. Yes. You know, the, 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 the executive producers, Will Packer, you know, you, you've got, you know, uh, black people behind the scenes, basically in charge of the Super Bowl of Hollywood. You know what I mean? And that's rarefied air. Like you don't get those opportunities. You don't you don't just fall off the truck and someone says, hey, you want to do the Oscars? Like it takes years and years of credits and all of that. So a real, real interesting perspective that you're able to have that seat. Yes. Because yes. many of us at home are watching this. Chris Rock makes the G.I. Jane joke. Right. Instantly, I'm assuming you guys knew Will Smith was not supposed to be walking on stage. Yes. Yes. But I will say yes. this. Um, we did a bit earlier that night where one of the hosts was interacting with the two other male presenters. Right. And a couple of people that were in the audience walked up on stage. So I think because that happened earlier in the night, it opened it up for the people in those front rows that happened to be stars that they could walk on stage. Yeah. Now, where are you when, are you watching this like, Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, I had, you know, a lot of people don't realize they like a lot of people think that the Oscars are just you put a tuxedo on and the stars just wing it. That's not what happens. You know what I mean? Like most of that stuff is very scripted aside from the impromptu moments of the acceptance speech and all that. So there's a lot of writing. There's a lot of pressure that comes with that. Like, it's the Oscars. Like there is a tremendous amount of pressure. And like I said, we wanted to over deliver. You know what I mean? Like black people don't get that real estate that often. Yep. So we were trying to really, really do the damn thing. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, so yep, go ahead. So uh, with that being said, you know, this is the last half hour of the show. The way the Oscars are like it accelerates. It's, the, you know, the last half hour you're getting to the bigger awards, the bigger awards. Right. I was backstage in the green room. Um, uh, Diddy was doing a uh, we were doing a tribute to the Godfather movies. And Diddy was the presenter presenting to Francis Ford Coppola, Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, like, you know, all the Godfather people. And this moment between Chris and Will happened right before that. So that was my last thing that I was technically responsible for. But when this happened, it changed everything. And it's also live TV. So you don't know in that moment, I didn't know how that was going to play itself out. Like it literally was above my pay grade. You know what I mean? So at that point, it's not about the jokes. It's not about, you know, what, 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 what's going to like, it, it was above my pay grade. Like that was something way different. But how did it? Uh, oh, well, go ahead. But it was the defining moment that the night became about. Yeah. How did you feel when they decided to continue the show? Um, like I said, you know, you it, it, it. it wasn't it wasn't uh, it wasn't my call. It wasn't my decision. You know what I mean? Like at that point, you know, you're it's live TV. It's live network TV. Like I was I didn't know what like I'll be honest with you. I didn't know what was going to happen in that moment. I know that I brought my daughter to the Oscars, which was, you know, amazing for me to be able to give that to my daughter because I know how long it took me to get there and to bring her and have her experience that and that teachable lesson of this is for you. This is yours as well. That's what I was focused on. So after the slap happened, I went to go check on my daughter. You know what I mean? Like I got that slap 
sent me into dad mode. Gotcha. You well, know what I mean? Why is that? Because of just you thought. Because I didn't know what was going to happen after that. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't know what was going to happen after that. And, you know, I don't want to sound like overly dramatic or anything, but in that moment, I don't think anybody knew what was going to happen. Because at first people were like, is that real? Was that, you know what I mean? Like, that's what, that's what the outside world was asking. But for somebody knew. that had been hired early on to write on the Oscars, I knew it was real. You know what I mean? And so I was like, well, let me make sure my daughter's cool because, you know, like I said, these are close family friends. And this is something that is playing out on live TV that is affecting us in a personal way. Yeah. Now, I have three questions centered around this. One is you mentioned that ideally, of course, being in the writer's seat, you knew that the slap that Will Smith gave Chris Rock was not a part of the script. Yes. Now, there was somebody, um, Cat Williams has commented on this, and he alluded to that this is a Hollywood game. This is, you know, they know how to manipulate things. Right. Um, right. Any response to just that statement that's been floating? Well, around? If, if they do, they kept me out of the loop. <laughs> they didn't tell me, and I was a writer on the show. <laughs> Fair enough. So, you know, and that's and that was like another thing, uh, another side about it. Just, you know, I mean, if we're really going to talk about this, let's talk about it. Um, yeah. It was very interesting to be a part of something that this moment happened and then everyone in the world had a perspective about it. And you had to hear everyone's perspective. And as somebody that was extremely close to it, I was silent on the issue. Like, you know what I mean? Like. I remember the day after the Oscars where it's all the newspapers and it's like, it's everywhere, right? I got a call from someone at the Washington Post and they go, yeah, I, uh, I, I heard you were a writer on the show. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say? And I was like, absolutely not. And he goes, uh, hey, just between you and me, this is just between you and me. And I was like, oh, really, really? Like, this ain't my first what rodeo, he, dog. I mean, so what was your reservation with about speaking about it right away? Well, you just... because no good could come from it. Like, e the, no matter what I said, they're going to frame it however they want. And I learned that the hard way. Because okay. I was on stage years prior to that uh, at the Laugh Factory when Michael Richards, Kramer, had his meltdown. So... I was one of the comics that went on early that night. And after that happened, um, the owner of the club asked me to do an interview. Right. And at that time, I was like, yeah, I'll help the club out. I was there. I have a point of view. I saw it. I'm going to talk from an honest place as a black man and as a stand up who didn't like that. And, di and, and I saw it. Right. So I had an authentic point of view. I shared my point of view in a TV setting and it was all twisted up. And so I learned back then that sometimes you got to just let things play itself out. Yeah. Now that that one, I'm humbled that you are speaking about that with us. So I, I appreciate it's also you. a year and a half later. So, <laughs> well, I still appreciate this with us to talk about it. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Now, instantly when it happens, are you you checked on your daughter? Are you are you guys checking on Chris Rock? Like is someone in his ear? Like, how does that work? Well, it, it was a, an assault at that point. So there's le legal ramifications. So that played itself out in that way. You know what I mean? Like I said, when I said all of a sudden it was above my pay grade, it was above my pay grade. So, you know, I was there in support to finish out the show and then go from there. And that's the other weird thing about the Oscars is, you know, you're there where the Oscars are held. And then after it's over and done, there's a party upstairs. You know what I mean? Like the first, 
like you basically, you know, I'm holding my daughter's train of her dress. We're taking an escalator up to a party and we're still like shook. You know what I mean? We're still like, yo, what, what just happened? You know what I'm saying? And like it was, it was surreal, dude. It was a surreal moment in time as, as you know, as weird as it is for everyone to experience it in their own individual ways, it was even weirder to be there and to be an integral part in the creative process. Yeah. And then my last question I have to ask, but because it, it seems like there's like an oath amongst the writers. No one's identifying. Did someone write that joke for Chris? Who owned, like who wrote it? Is well, I, you know what? I'll say this. I don't think it's about the joke. I do feel that to attack the joke is to miss the point. You know what I mean? Like Chris Rock is a professional. He's a two time former Oscar host. Will Smith was nominated for best actor that night. That should have been both of their finest moments and it wasn't. And to try and make it about the joke does a disservice to what comedy is, to what we expect comedy to be. Because if you make it about the joke, then you say, hey, you better watch what you say because I have the right to attack you if I don't agree with what you say. And I don't, I don't think that that should ever exist in comedy. And yes. when that happened that night, I instantly knew as a 30 year veteran of stand up that there was gonna be a trickle down in the clubs that because they saw it and they saw it play itself out like that, now when you go to a comedy club, if some drunk dude in the front row doesn't get what you're saying or feels like, you know, you said something offensive to him or you made him feel embarrassed, he's got the right to walk up on stage and attack you. And we saw that happen with Dave Chappelle at the Hollywood Bowl. We saw it happen with Atheon Crockett on stage. Like that played itself out. So it's to me, it's never about the joke. And I think that that's a terrible misconception to attack the joke. Yeah, I think um, for the people that more so put an emphasis on the joke is that they just wondered if something else was said, would this have been avoided? Or do you think just maybe, I mean, then this might get into like, you know, he say, she say and and, and I, I definitely don't want to do that. And that's not that's not why I'm here. I think the purpose of why I was there, like for me, um, like I said, I, I guest starred on The Fresh Prince. Our, yeah. you know, our kids are friends. You know, uh, I, I've worked with Will Smith. I, I, I wrote on the Kids Choice Awards for him. You know what I mean? Like I am entrenched in this game in a bunch of different ways. So. I would never profess to walk in someone's shoes and, you know, rule a verdict on what I thought. Like, that's not what it's about to me. Yeah, it's it's got to be a tough position to, to, to be in um, just across the board. Of course. Of course. Like, I think that should have been I, I, I think that that night and those Academy Awards should have been a win for everybody that tuned in, but especially for black people because we were behind the scenes being able to usher in our version of that show. Yeah. To kind of put a button at the end of this part of our conversation, I started off the question with the parallels that might have been the experience for you. Did it trigger you at any point when you saw Chris get hit as being Chris, a smaller guy, did you kind of, did it make you kind of like, oh, like, did it bother you it, in that way? Um, you know, you never want to see your hero in a non-heroic sense. You know what I mean? And both those dudes are my heroes to some extent. You know what I'm saying? Like they both motivated me to see how far I could take my talent in this business. You know what I mean? Like those dudes are legends. They are game changers. They're icons. You never want to see an icon in a less than iconic moment. Got you. Truly. Now, moving on, moving along. Um, Chris Rock is regarded as one of our greats. Like you just mentioned him as being an icon. 
um, there's been other icons before him, uh, such as like Sinbad. Sure. Um, I believe that you worked with Sinbad. Were there, um, what about any stories and working with him on a different well, world? Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, one of the first jobs I ever did when I was in college, I did extra work on a different world. And yeah. that was a great foundation for me to um, be around people that were doing it on a major level. You know, Debbie Allen directed that show. Uh, Kadeem Hardison, you know, like everybody that was associated with that show, you know, the, the, these are ra this is rarefied air. You know what I mean? Like and that was where I first was learning about the business and, and finding my place in the business. You know, I started out doing extra work. I uh, played this character named Clarence Peel, who worked uh, with with Mr. Gaines uh, in, in the, in the place that, you know, they got their lunch and stuff. So, you know, I wouldn't have lines, but you would see me in there. I wore these big kind of nerdy glasses. And that was my first real opportunity, like on camera opportunity. Um, Sinbad was an established comic. He was well on his way. We became friends from that experience. Uh, he ended up taking me on the road with him. So, uh, you know, he was a clean comic. I was, you know, clean at that time. I'm still pretty clean, you know what I mean? But that opportunity allowed me to, you know, have an experience with Sinbad. Uh, I ended up writing on Vibe uh, for Chris Spencer when he was the host. And then when Sinbad took over, because of our relationship that was formed on a different world, I stayed on and wrote for him. So I'm super grateful for all the things that I learned from these legends that came before me. And that's something that I think a lot of younger comics don't realize. They think that they're in it by themselves but you can learn a lot from people that have walked down the road that you're trying to walk down. Understood. Now, as far as, um, and then I'm kind of, I'll, I'll be wrapping this up in just a bit. Now, as far as working with Sinbad, you know, he would uh, recently have a stroke. Yeah. Um, how did that, how did that impact you? And have you already been maybe prepared to, not necessarily him specifically, but when someone is sick or sick or takes a toll on their health like that, or even lose their life, have you had like experiences that kind of prepared you for the moment that you would get the news that um, Simba had a stroke? Well, um, you know, I, I, I was a, I'm aware of you know Simba's health concerns. You know, I I send nothing but love his way. You know, I'm really thankful for the role that he played in my development as a stand-up, you know, I'm, I'm super grateful for that. Um, in terms of losses of giants that were around me, you know, John Witherspoon passed away. That was a tremendous loss for everybody in the comedy community because, you know, when I first started doing stand-up, Witherspoon was one of those early giants that were in the, in, in the club, you know, I, I probably saw Witherspoon, you know, two or three hundred times on stage, like in my first five years of stand up. So I learned what it meant to be a professional and somebody who was great. And that was before, you know, he got his shine in Fridays. And you know what I mean? Like before he really popped and like boomerang and all that, he was in the clubs doing his thing like those are the people that you learn how to be a professional. You know what I mean? That education is invaluable. And so when you lose them, you know, it, you like, like it, it, it hurts your heart. You, you know what I mean? Because you remember all the times that you had with them when they were here. Yeah. Um, I, I, I kind of have uh, two more points to make and then um this has been a great interview by the way yeah i like that <laughs> when we first when we first started we talked about your upbringing and you being a predominantly like a, in a predominantly white environment and somehow of finding your inner voice within yourself still being able to be proud to be black but at the same time um being able to know how to maneuver 
in your environment. Um, I think that's a reflection of how Hollywood kind of operates today, entertainment. You know, it's not a lot of us, we're there, but in terms of like positions and roles, and I would assume as a writer, there might be less of us in, in the Oh, there's spaces. a lot less. There's a lot less. Yeah. Like when I first started writing and producing, that was the thing that I quickly learned, whereas like, yeah, there's a lot of black actors and comedians and actresses. There's a whole lot less black writers. I think there's more now. Um, you know, in 2008, I was a writer on The Tonight Show, right? Which was Jay Leno's last year. And I was the only black writer. And the reason I got that job was because Barack Obama secured the nomination for president. So uh, executive at NBC was like, hey, we're about to have a black president. We, we probably should have a black writer on The Tonight Show. You know what I mean? So, so they had that honest with you about that. Well, that was the that was the mandate. That's that was the mandate. That's that's how change happened in 2008. It took the success of Barack Obama to lead to me getting a job as a black writer on The Tonight Show. And. I say that just to say we're still we're still forging forward in this business. You know what I mean? Like we are still making progress in areas that vitally need our input and our expertise and, you know, our life experience. So mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, I grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood maybe allowed me to navigate that space where you're the yep. only black writer. You know what I mean? Yep. But no. they still want you to be black. You know what I mean? And, and bring your, you know, bring the sauce. You know what I'm saying? It kind of made me, um, so I, I laid up that information there because one, you know, you being someone that has um, got mentorship from Gary Shanley, um, also worked with Alexis Seinfeld, you know, there's an essence of where you're in these white spaces and getting influence, but also staying true to your roots. Right. So that if I see you down the street, I can give you a head nod and feel like, OK, he's right. I haven't lost him. Right. No, not at all. Not at all. Now, there's one there's 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 a conversation. Um, and I'm not trying I'm not going to get in no mess, but I have to be authentic here when it comes with um chris rock and his relationship with our community um there's been times where i think he's been the king of the world there's also been times where it seems like he um not saying that he's purposely doing it because i do not know him but it does seem like there's we're not as tight as we once were any perspective around that of how chris maybe lost his connection with us um, yeah, just, just I, that I think that I think the uh, the familiarity of a particular talent, right? The higher you go, mm. the less authentic you feel to the core base that first discovered you. You know what I mean? It's like hip hop. Like when I was in college and Public Enemy was brand new and I went to go see Public Enemy live, it was 85% black people. 10 years later, I go see Public Enemy again. I have the same authentic connection as to when they first dropped. It's 95% white. Is that Public Enemy's fault? Right. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, yeah. That happens to a lot of our rappers. Yes. You know, some yes. of them have issues yes. when they have their white fans say the N word. And it's just like, what what do you do in that dynamic? I, I guess that is a little of a tough decision. Yeah, it's like I think that I think you have to move in a way. That makes sense for your authentic self, you know what I mean? And the other stuff you can't really control. Like you can tell a joke, you can't dictate who it's gonna go to and how it's gonna be received. You know what I mean? Just because the other side receives it more than the people you want to receive it, does it mean that you stop telling the joke? I think as artists, the worst thing we can do is shut ourselves down. And I think we have to give artists the grace to be artists. We may not agree with everything that they do. You know what I mean? No artist is perfect. 
You know, you mentioned Cat Williams earlier. Cat has his own stuff that if he could go back and edit out parts of himself, he definitely would. But I tell you this, every time Cat Williams steps on stage, he's got my attention. So I take people as they are. You can be a flawed artist, but as long as you're being an artist, I'm rocking with you. That's fair. Now in um, conclusion, there was a conversation, you brought this up too, uh, and we touched on this before, about where have you been, where have you been, and hopefully people that have been watching this interview, they've learned that you've been around the whole time. Yeah. You just have been sitting in a different seat that doesn't present itself on camera. There was an incident that we came across where a woman made a comment towards you at the airport. Um, <laughs> <is there any laughs> <proof of that? laughs> and what did she say to you? Uh, and then how so did you, I was, you um, responded uh, with laughter? I yeah, I was doing shows with Sean Wayans, right? Which was super cool. Like Sean asked me if I uh, would open for him. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And it was the first chance that I really had to go out and see the impact that these characters I created uh, made. You know what I mean? Because like, if you stay in Hollywood, you know, Hollywood is about, you know, what are you doing now? And what's next? You know, like they really discredit the things that you've already done. And so I'm going through the TSA, right? And this TSA worker goes, Jamie Foxx left your ass. <laughs> and it was like, it was so wrong. It was hilarious to me. Cause I was like, uh, I'm about to leave your ass. <laughs> Cause I'm getting on this flight and I'm flying back to Hollywood, you know what I mean? To go work with Jamie. Yeah, and, and right, and me and Jamie are still cool, you know what I mean? Right. But it's like, people, like, that's also like, I, you know, that's just a testament that you actually matter to people, you know what I mean? That they feel they can say anything to you. Like, so I laugh at the fact that that was the most uncool thing you could say to me. Like, I would have preferred, you know, hey, crazy legs or whatever, right? But it, it did make me laugh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, a, I think that's, um, it, it opens up the, the layers of what the perception of stars like Jamie should do. Cause right. he's not obligated to right. anyone else, but his family and himself. Right. And right. so, you know, there's that expectation of, well, Jamie's supposed to put everybody on around him. I've seen that right. before. Right. And then I think it is a, it is a genuine response of a fan who um, one would see you on the show to be like, well, what's been going on? Maybe more so projecting that they loved you so much and they liked you so much that they should have seen you more. Right. Is there any reason why outside of your decisions, is there any reasons why like you feel that we haven't seen you more on screen or was it just deliberately saying, I'm gonna go and get money with writing and kind of be secure there? Well, like I said, I, I feel like when the writing and producing started happening, it didn't stop. And so, you know, it's like when someone's offering you a chance to wield power with the pen and you don't have to go audition and prove your work as an actor, like, why wouldn't you do that? I, I definitely feel like the people that know the business understand the power of writing and producing. I think the people that just like what they like and they like the fact that I've created stuff on camera that people dig, and are into, they want to see me create more stuff, which is cool. Like I'm, I'm with that, but who's to say that I'm, I'm done creating, you know what I mean? Like I, I definitely, like I'm in, I'm in a, a, at a point in my career right now, especially post Oscars where it's like, okay, I get to decide what I want to do next. If I want to go back to acting, I can always do that. You know what I mean? I now have the skills with the pen that I can also write something that may be bigger than anything I've created up until this point. And that's exciting. Got you. So with that being said, um, would you want to return back to acting? Oh, absolutely. That's what you get the credit for. So why not? <laughs> why not? Um, so I'll just say this has been a great conversation. I feel like there's many more things that we could have touched on, but I do want to respect your time and ours. Um, with that being said, Mr. Sully McCullough, 
thank you for your first one-on-one -on -one with Hype Plus. And uh, before you get out of here, let us know, how can we support you and keep up with your next moves? Well, I'm on all social media platforms as my name, Suli McCullough, S-U-L-I-M-C-C-U-L-L-O-U-G-H. Not mouse, not crazy legs, but Suli McCullough. So support me there. Um, you know, I'm still on stage. I'm at the clubs. And uh, stay tuned because there's more to come. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs>